You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good afternoon, everybody. This is Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens, and there is no one to my left today. Uh, He decided it's my time to fly solo. So we have a really special guest for you today. We have Norman Potter. He is a musky fishing, passionate savant of the Upper Potomac River. Um, we were looking far and wide for somebody to really shine a light on some of the musky fishing opportunities that we have here. Norman, how are you doing today, bud? I'm doing good. How are you doing? I'm doing wonderful. So really let the audience know, like, what's your history with this area and what kind of got you into musky fishing? I grew up here. I've fished the Potomac River and Conakajig Creek my whole life, to be honest with you, for smallmouth. Fished tournaments, was part of Brunswick Bassmasters for a good many years. One day I seen a couple pictures of one of my buddies posted on Facebook. I actually asked him and said, hey man, what are you doing? Where's them fish at? Mm-hmm. He said, can't tell you that. He said, but I can tell you we're catching them at nighttime. Well, went and got a couple baits, a couple swim baits actually, a couple big Kitek baits and just went went out cast and I actually got lucky and I hooked one. Wasn't but two or three days later, I, I bought four or five baits off of a guy I know, Alan Forrest. And before you know it, I was chasing these fish like crazy, man. Yeah, it's been it's been probably eight years solid now, chasing them steady. But the past the past six, it's been my life. Mm-hmm. It's eat, sleep, breathe, live muskies, man. That's that's all it is. Other than that. There's there's really nothing else besides work and musky fishing. We were talking before the show got started here. Um, you, he, Norman reached out to me actually via Facebook. He saw our our Jason interview where we really discussed about the the stocking program in in Virginia for muskies, and he reached out to me about the amazing opportunities that the Potomac River had, um, and it it really does. And why didn't you think people really realize the Potomac is what it is when it comes to muskie? For one, it's not out there. I don't really know why, but it didn't take off. Maryland had a program going on. It just didn't take off. Everybody wasn't reporting their catches and people didn't want to talk about it. It was just really tight lipped. There's, there's a lot of guys out there that do it, but I don't, I don't know exactly why it didn't take off. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it was because it's not as big of an area as other areas or if it's, I don't know the exact reason to be completely honest with you. It's just, it hasn't happened, but there's a lot of opportunities out there and it's, it's only going to grow if people know. And I've told everybody this, I take a lot of guys out for their first time. I took a guy out this morning to be completely honest with you. took him out for his first time ever out on the boat, chasing muskies and everybody, everybody that I've taken for the first time, they light up. Mm -hmm. That's, that's just crazy. You know, how can you not experience that? and enjoy it it's just the fish of ten thousand cast not everybody's going to catch one the first trip but there's always that chance getting out there and just experiencing it makes you want to go and do it again so and that's something like you said the ten thousand casts which is crazy because i looked at your your social media feed dude and you kick ass with some of these these are monsters that you're catching <laughs> is it really like is it really 10,000 casts or is it a little bit easier to play the odds when you go out there? Cause it's, dude, you're catching freaking monsters. It's every bit of it there. You see, you see the success. That's all you see. And that's, there's yeah. no sugar coating to it. There's thousands of hours. You want me to be completely honest with you? My helix broke down today. I was trying to troubleshoot it. 587 hours in wow. eight months. Wow. 587 oh hours in eight months. That's I nice. asked her when I bought that Helix unit this morning on the way here. I said, when do we buy that Helix unit? Eight months, 587 hours. That's freaking insane. All right. Oh <laughs> now, I just told you, I just took off 21 days of work to do what? Fish. Mm-hmm. Constant. What what happened in them 21 days? I caught two 30-pound fish, but... That's the two biggest fish of my life, to be completely honest with you. I worked hard for them two fish, and that's there's no other way to do it. 
you cannot chase these fish on a hear and go basis. Mm -hmm. You're either going to put the time in and do it or you can't. It's a committed relationship. It's, it's committed. You can go out and you can go out and chase every weekend, once a month and catch, you know, catch muskies, but to catch big fish, it takes time. It takes time. now how many follows did you get in that time period like was it was it just those two that you stuck and that's it or did you have a bunch of follows countless that's countless when them in that 21 day period it was 21 days or no actually it was 20 days exactly i broke it down the other day it was 20 days exactly between them two fish the day before i caught that fish me and her was down there fishing i had a big fish up following hooked it both side lost it mm mind blown like man what is going on at that point i was in a slump i guarantee it was every bit of 30 days yeah we went well no i'm lying i'm lying it wasn't 30 days because we went down for our thanksgiving trip and fish with a buddy chase gibson i caught two fish down there but before that was 39 days yeah it was up to 39 days is what it was Yep. good lord it's crazy man it just the hours is what was the biggest one you caught this year? 48 and a half. That's the biggest fish that I've ever caught. 48, 48 and a half inches. What's funny is the big, the longest fish that I caught was actually an inch and a half shorter in girth than the second fish that I caught this month. Good yes. Lord. Crazy. Crazy. And I got to hear the story. Come on. you. Got, I got to hear the story of, of you catching the fish of a lifetime here. Um, Paint the scene right. for everybody. I... Like I said, the day before, hooked that fish. I was kind of devastated. I wasn't going to go. She was like, ah, oh, you, you might as well go. Save the day. I, it was probably 10, 30, 11 o'clock. I headed down, about an hour and a half drive. I headed down to the lake, pulled in the parking lot. My good buddy's there. He's out there on his kayak. So um, I get out on the lake, get over talking to him, and we part ways. I did not even get a rod in my hand, and when he's usually on his kayak down there and mm -hmm. he he'll shout out a whistle if he hooks a fish and needs some help I'm telling you i didn't get a rod in my hand he shouted out a whistle turn around he's fighting it so i put the troll motor on high and run over to him he nets the fish and he sets down and, hey i got a good one norman he, he porpoise right in front of me i threw the glide bait in front of me he ate it man i couldn't believe it happened Told him that's awesome, man. Help him get pictures, and we get it unhooked. Part ways mm -hmm. again. He goes this way. I go this way. I cast up in this brush pile. I've, it was probably four, four or five casts in. Cast up in this brush pile, and I got snagged and shaking it out. We get the bait out of there, and I tell you, fish comes following out. Right as I pull it, I'm like, "You gotta be kidding me!" Big old fish. Like I, I could see it. Big old fish. Big old fat belly on it. So I'm going into the figure eight, trying to make sure I don't touch the boat. I watch her. She's just down there lazy following mm. it. Lazy following it. So I start speeding it up, speeding it up. I probably got about eight laps into figure eight. And I kept telling myself, if if this fish is going to eat, she's going to eat it in this top turn right here. I was wrong. I brought it up, up through the top turn. And I, I tried to flick the bait to get her to eat. And she wouldn't. As soon as I brought it down into the straightaway, that's the place you do not want these fish to eat is in the straightaway. Bait disappears. Was yeah. It, was it like almost like slow motion yes. at that point? Oh, my heart is thumping the whole time. I'm on my knees. I'm on my knees in my boat figure eight in this fish. Oh, my God. Bait disappears. And they... I've and heard you're by of, yourself, right? Yes, by myself. Good Lord. By myself. And I've heard of I've heard a bunch of guys that have more experience than me talk about the fig when they eat in the figure eight. I don't have a lot of experience in the figure eight fishing on the Potomac. The Potomac is so clear. Mm -hmm. You want the fish to eat away from the boat. So I don't have a whole, whole lot of experience with that. Past couple of years, I've gotten better fishing lakes. So I heard, you know, if the fish eats it in the straightaway, you want to try to pull the rod, you know, away from across the fish's head to set the hook on the fish okay. to get the hooks planted. So that's all that's going through my mind. Like if she don't eat in the top corner, I need to make sure I get a good hook set on it. I, I keep thinking, cause the day before I blew a good fish, right up right boat side. So she eats and I set the hook and I feel her, like I feel her thrashing. So I'm stumbling to get up by oh my myself. I, my boat's got an open deck or open middle uh, 
deck on the front, deck on the rear. I stumble down into the bottom of the boat and my net, the way I set my net, I set the hoop here and here's the other side. So my, my uh, handles across this way, okay. I stumble down and I'm like trying to get across the net so I can get on this side to hold the rod in this hand to get the net with this, with the left hand and pull it up around yeah. the boat. And you have hooked it, like a small goat on the yes. end of line while you're trying to hold this, this fish weighed, and do this. this fish weighed uh, 39, 39, 41 is what oh, the fish weighed. Good I'll get Lord. to that here in a second. But yeah, I get up on the back deck and it was just meant to happen. As soon as I swung the net over the, over the top of the motor, I lifted the fish's head up and just, she went right in the bag. Perfect. That never, anybody that knows me, meant to be knows that does not happen that is meant to be yes dude. it was meant to happen and i just dropped my knees and started crying man like and rick rick watched it all happen across like across the lake he's like dude i seen he's like i seen you stumble over the boat and watched you net it he's like it was just crazy he come over he had gopro mm. on we got all in footage and usually usually when i'm by myself i try to set up my phone and get a little video myself so i was shaking there was no way that could happen we Dude, get a measurements ugh. get the fish released and i'm just like man can this it's you know, can this even happen to me so i'm like pinch me you know just check me make sure i'm alive <laughs> how long do you think that like fr from from hook and mouth to in the net how long do you think that actually lasted like i know like when you're in the moment like probably 40 seconds for, oh my god 40 seconds i can tell you but it feels like an hour yes it felt like <laughs> eternity man it just it never ends because when you're in that moment so many things can go wrong in so little bit of time all right i didn't show you these pictures and i have to show you these right now as we're talking about this so you can just imagine and then guys i'm gonna the for power people watching this on youtube i'm gonna flash a picture on the screen at this point over my ugly face so you that guys can take a look at this that is a that is a two hundred pound split ring. Good lord. So, yeah. viewers at home, I'm gonna send an edited picture of this, um, just so you can blow it up to see it a little bit. But like, that's that's, that's freaking nuts. That's the kind of things that can go wrong so quick. That happened. Uh, when did I catch the last one? The last big one I caught. Mm -hmm. That actually happened on the last big one. That one didn't go as good. So we got it released and realized everything was good and let the fish go everything was good and i kept telling myself i said you know i'll never catch a fish that size again it would never happen i actually w took her back down went back down fished the lake again my buddy rick was down there again he's disgusted he's like man i haven't seen a fish in it's been like four days i haven't seen a fish mm -hmm. i'm like oh calm down man you're all right you're all right it's, Threw a bait up inside the tree, moved one, didn't see nothing else. I let it go, what, five, six more days before I went back down. Went back down by myself. I'm, I wanted to go down for an evening trip. Went back down by myself, same exact bait. Probably 300 yards from where I caught that first fish. I got pan optics for Christmas, so that was what was kind of crazy. I'm jigging, just jigging down along through there. See a fish over along the tree about 40 feet away. Oh, I wow. pick up the rod with that same bait on it, pitch it up beside the tree. I'm telling you, I watched it come right up on the pan optics screen. Dude, looked like the tree uprooted eat my bait. Oh my God. I told her, I said, I would never in my life forget that. The coolest never. video game ever. <laughs> that dude, that is never wild. Never will forget that a day in my life. But I thought it was the same fish because actually after i caught the first one i talked to the biologist i told him where i caught it at gave him some gps coordinates and all and he went looking for it sure enough two minutes into his search he found the fish seriously yes the biologist shocked the fish up weighed it because i had we used the musky calculator they have a, a formula the length and the girth type it in there they'll give you the weight Okay. We, we, I'm against weighing fish completely. That's just safe part of the safe handling process that I'll explain later. And I was kind of curious. I said, you know, send me a picture of that fish. He, he swore he had it. Send me a picture of that fish. Mm -hmm. Sent me a picture of it, matched it up. There was a scratch right here. Well, little distinctive mark right underneath her eye. 
matched up. He said, Norman, that's the same fish, man. I'm telling you, it's the same fish. He said, it's got a tag in it now, so we'll be able to know for the next That's crazy. Time. Yep. So, like, for the Potomac, um, for the people that don't know, the Upper Potomac really, I, I, I would say the end point is at Harper's Ferry for just the upper part. We're going to separate it from Harper's Ferry all the way up to really past, I think, Dam 5, right? Would you go? Or how far up would you say that part? Way of further. Potomac? Way further. Uh, that yeah. you're comfortable fishing or have I'm, experience with. I'm comfortable. I'm comfortable as far as the river will allow me to go. But I do not. I generally do not like to go up around the Cumberland area. It gets really, really sketchy up there. You got to have a drift okay. boat like I was talking about okay. earlier, but comfortably little Orleans down. I really like okay. fishing that area. So we'll say uh, for the viewers at home, we'll say Cumberland, Maryland, all the way to Harper's Ferry is, yes. is, the, is part one of the, upper, of the upper Potomac. And then the main stem of the upper Potomac is where the Shenandoah River and the Potomac meet at Harper's Ferry. And that goes all the way to the falls. Um, so, I mean, yeah, I, I like to break it down just, just in general, like from Cumberland to there, like what is the muskie population like comparatively to the James, the new, um, the Susquehanna, like the main That's, rivers in this area? It's hard to pinpoint numbers on it because we don't have the studies mm -hmm. like the James is the James really has a, a hand on what they have going on right now. They just did their warm water study. So they kind of have a handle on what's going on a little bit more. But our our natural our natural reproduction has just gotten crazy. To be completely honest with you, it's it's everywhere. Everywhere you go, you're seeing little fish now. Really, I'd say since I got her into it about two years ago, we've we've really noticed a lot of them. We've done a lot more night fishing, and I don't know if it's because of the the pressure. Mm -hmm. Also, with COVID, more people fishing this yeah. time and more people being out. But the littler fish, you see them at nighttime like crazy. Anytime after dark, you can take a spotlight and ride. You can ride up the river and just spot them. I'm telling you, it's crazy. It's crazy. The little fish are just, they're everywhere right now. And I hope it, I hope we have another good successful year this year and it just continues to grow. So do you ever fish or are there any musky in the main stem of the upper Potomac? Or is it primarily, you think the juice, so to speak, if you've never done it before, is between like Harper's Ferry and Cumberland then? Or or is there anything anywhere else on the river? For me, it's it's tougher fishing down that way because I don't really get down below Brunswick hardly okay. ever. I've heard of guys catching them down there. So they I do have, exist. Yeah, there. I have a yeah. friend that actually does fish down around where the Shenandoah flows in and he's told me he's caught a good number of fish down there, but he more fishes up on the Shenandoah a lot more. Okay. He's piqued my interest a lot the past couple months and got me, I went on a night mission. Uh, it's been probably about a month ago. Now I got off work and I said, I'm, I got to ride down here and check all this stuff out. Riverton, Luray, all that. I just went, mm -hmm. me and my buddy just went for a ride with our phones and spotlight and just went, and just checked, you know what I mean? Just checking these boat ramps, just seeing what the water levels was. Cause he got my, my interest peaked in it. And then like a week or two later, you guys had Jason on and it was like, wow. Yeah, there's there's a lot of good fish in the Shenandoah too. And there's a lot of good fish, but it's so weird because the Shenandoah and the Potomac are, are so much like twinsies because they are so close, especially in the DMV area, like this area, they're so close to each other. And it, it's just, it's so weird. Like the Potomac is a, the wild west. Everyone, if you type in Potomac, you think the title Bassmasters, all that, all that stuff. You don't understand. Like there's another portion. There's another animal here. Um, but to, yeah, to get into like the musky fishing, really, just I would really like to start with because I've never actually specifically targeted them, but I would like to. Like, what is the musky's behavior like? Like, how do you when you go there? Like, what do you look for? And and what? How do you approach a day of musky fishing if you've never been to that? Like, if you're looking at a map, what are you doing? What are you looking at? First off, you have to get yourself comfortable and familiar with your equipment. I mean, that's that's the first part of your mm -hmm. success. And any you can do that on any body of water. You don't have to fish on a body of water that has muskies in it to get comfortable. But once you get comfortable, then you start looking for areas. Okay. When you pull up, all right, pull up the river map. Dams, creek mouths anywhere that can hold muskies are a lot and i found this i've argued with other guys about this but they're a lot like smallmouth they're a lot like smallmouth in my eyes the way i used to fish smallmouth really converted over to me fishing muskies to be completely honest with you wintertime smallmouth fishing in particular 
finding the low slow pools and off okay. the current breaks instead of fishing the really dead water are they more like active in the winter yes you fit yes okay. you know what i mean and instead of fishing the more dead water you fish the the current break itself gotcha. right where the seam is and they're right there i'm telling you if the a fish is there and it's actively feeding you're going to know it soon okay. you're going to know it soon and secondly and the water temperature can tell you everything if if you get you get to a point where you're not getting any follows you know you're not seeing any fish you move on to another spot the water temperature is the same all right you start looking for either colder water or warmer water just like you would mostly other fish a, a big thing that deters a lot of people with musky fishing you know they're thinking oh i throw this big bait and two foot of water there there's not gonna be a musky there mm -hmm. <laughs> you'd be surprised where some of these fish lay at and it's just opportunity that's all it's about. You know what I mean? If if the water's warmer on this bank today and it's two foot of water over here and there's not a lot of current, they can be there. It's a river system. It changes all the time and they just, they, they move. Are, are, are musky territorial? Like Very. Do, so, because like, um, you mentioned earlier, the one that you caught, you could go right back there and, and the biologist found him. So yeah. if, if you're going down the river, it's like, are there specific, like, I guess, kill zones that they're going to stay in because like i mean a musky guys if you don't know this thing is like a, a wolf it is the top predator in the food chain so not only i think is it get the best piece of cover but so once you find an area you kind of know like these are the hot zones i want to pick so you're not just fishing the whole stretch of the river you got specific yeah. areas okay once a lot of times say you, you catch a fish off a of brush pile or you catch a fish behind the eddy or mm -hmm. off a big deep pool you know you can usually duplicate your spots two, three, four times in a day. It's it's pretty easy to pattern the fish on a river compared to a lake mm -hmm. as as to locations. It's not it's not as hard as you as you want to think. All right, the, they're big fish. They can hide very easily, but at the same exact time, like you said, they're the top of the food chain. They're going to be eating. All right. Everybody asks, you know, can a fish, can a fish hide, be, can a four foot fish hide behind a four inch log? Yes, it can. Yes, it can. I've, I've seen it several times. Guys with this new live imaging and uh, the mega imaging, actually, mm -hmm. you see a lot of the newer guys taking it up and going around the, going around a log like this and see a fish. It's crazy. You know what I mean? Just yeah, the way it, they, they. It, the technology is insane. It's it's crazy. Some of the just some of the places you find these fish. What are the it's crazy on the rivers? What is the seasonal behavior like? Like so, like like in the springtime because we're in like midwinter. So let's just kind of go through it for for everyone at home. So in the springtime, like do they act just like musky? Are their behaviors kind of the same? Um, are, do they spawn in the springtime? Like what do they do in the river system? Yeah, mainly from about this time of year, January all the way up until mid-march they're really putting the feed bag on they're one okay. they're getting ready for that spawn period spawn mid mid-march in through april to the beginning of may it ends a little earlier starts a little bit later sometimes mm -hmm. it all depends on water temperature but that's usually our general cutoff we'll cut off around mid-march and pick up right around the beginning of may and then fish until the water temperatures get warm but yeah their seasonal behavior man right now they're they're feeding up big time and you say they the, really they're oh. really serious about putting the feed bag mm -hmm. on. You'll see a fish follow bait all the way up to the boat, and you won't think ah, that fish ain't going to eat my bait at the boat. Bang! There you go. That boat. Sometimes that boat don't matter. Sometimes it does. It's all their attitude is what matters. And you said up uh, until the water gets warm. Is that because like the musky season ends, you're not allowed to fish for them anymore, or what happens in the summertime with musky when the water gets warm? Well, it's a, it's a very touchy touchy subject and i think people need our to hear season this. doesn't yeah. our season doesn't ever end mm -hmm. our, we can legally we can fish for muskies 365 days a year and there's nothing that dnr can or will say about it but as an avid musky angler and someone who cares about the fish here in the recent years there's been a thing called delayed mortality in the higher water temperatures 
70 water, 70 degree water temperature is our cutoff. I, I strictly, 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 I, I stand by this really, really strong in the stagnant water, man. Anything, anything that gets hot and does not have current movement is bad. When it gets, when it gets into the middle of the summer, just cut it down, man. It's, it's not worth chancing it. There's guys that do mm -hmm. it and I, so they're catchable, but it, it's the it's the morality. It's the of, release. Yeah, it's you the can release. release the, yeah. You release the fish. The fish will swim off. Yeah, and then die afterwards. It's mm. been. I'm not a biologist, and I don't have all the rhyme to the reason for it. But it's it's been proven in studies. James River, the new river, they just went through their study. They just did a study out on Stonewall Jackson. One of my good friends, Chase Gibson, was part of it. He he stresses the high high end of it only only so many fish died in their study but you had an experienced angler doing it mm -hmm. at the same exact time you take somebody who's never never fished for these fish before they go out and they catch one they're going to want to take a picture they're going to want to get a good measurement on it mm -hmm. it might be the fish of their lifetime they might yeah. want to they might want to get a replica of this fish mm -hmm. and they have every right to but at the same exact time it could possibly harm the fish's well-being. You yeah. Know what I mean, so that's why we try to stress that we've we've asked about a closed season for that time, and it gets, you know, I mean, it gets mm -hmm. brought up to other ways because then what are you going to do when you get that year when you have good water flow and you never get that water temperature? Then you're going to be mad mm -hmm. because you have a closed season now. So we just so that's good to know for everyone at home. Like, so yeah. when the water hits about seventy degrees, if you're interested in musky fishing. Think about dialing it back, yep. um, and then 80, really eighty degrees is the the hundred percent prime. Okay. You're done. So 70, seventy degrees is when you want to. Well, seventy is when you want to start thinking about. Okay. It. okay, seventy is when you really want to start thinking about it because it can, in the middle of the summer, it can skyrocket overnight. Mm -hmm. Like I was saying, you can have one day that's seventy degrees, and then the next day you got seventy five. Well, what do you got the next day? And this is even water temperature. If you want to do night fishing, correct? Like yes, just completely yes. cut it off. And okay, cool. You have guys that say, all right, well, once we get to 80 degree temperatures, it drops back to 76 at nighttime. You know, it's, it's a dual edged sword. You know what I mean? That's why I say once it gets to 70, that's when I start thinking about it. You know what I mean? I, it, it goes through my brain. I start, start processing, you know what I mean? These fish can't be out of the water as long. We don't want to take as many pictures. We, we always, we always think about the handling of the fish. You know, we're, we're a hundred percent natural reproduction. Re That's Ugh. impressive, though, that that this because you think about all the stocking like Virginia does, and I've seen the pictures that that you have been posting and stuff, and the ones that you share with me. It's there; those are quality fish anywhere in the country. I mean, I'm talking like if you if you held that up compared to somebody that caught one in Minnesota, damn, dude, they, they're like that's like perfectly a spitting image of each other. And so what we have here is something that we need to protect. Protect, you're the, exactly right. It, it's insane. Mm -hmm. Get you, you got. You got all the time in the summertime to get your hooks, your gear, everything ready. Come middle of September, it's time to start thinking about these fish all the way up and through January. January comes, we get a little bit of bad weather, so we get shut down a little bit for that. Mm -hmm. Sometimes boat ramps get slick. We don't want to take chances on that or whatever, but we still do. We salt the ramps, do what we got to do to get out sometimes. But then we go through to the spawn. Like I said, mid-March, we start thinking about the spawn back it down april all month of april i don't i usually don't fish anywhere the month of april at all i try to that's when i send my reels out i send my reels out the month of april and then like i said mid-may back full blown again the beginning of may we start getting but by mid-may i'm i'm full blown again all the way up until i start seeing that 70 75 degree <sighs> water temperature and mm. it don't stop man i'm telling you get home from work i I keep two rods and a bucket of baits ready to go at all times. Keep my net in the boat. Keep my bump board in the boat. Batteries juiced up. And that, guys, is a hell of a segue, too, because this is the question that we get asked a lot when we talk about this is, what's the gear? What are the tools of the trade that you need? And I think we got the right man for the job. So, dude, you could just take it away. What do you want to start with? Well, first off, you you have to have a net. That's That's the number one thing. There's so many different nets on the market, but there's there's a lot of pros and cons with them. You hear guys saying 
you don't want to use this kind of net. You don't want to use that kind of net. Always something to keep in mind is to have a rubberized coated bag, something big enough to keep the fish in, to keep the fish well-being. Uh, their head in the water. You don't want them to be crunched up like a pretzel. You want to mm -hmm. try to give them room to swim in. That's why I try to use a big net. I use the RS, I use the RS Solo Slimer, as you see here. It's a big rubberized coated net. Hooks can't get stuck into the bag. You get a you get a fish that gets hooked, get the extra hooks inside the bag. They don't get snagged in there and get them taken out real easy. Just something you got to think about. That's that's number one. You see a lot of guys that bank fish. You could fit a they, Great Dane or a midget in that thing. That thing is huge. You see a lot of guys that bank fish that have smaller <laughs> nets. It's Fraybill makes us a, a smaller one. I think it's called a power catch. A little bit smaller, same type of netting. You don't need something that big, but like I said, man, when you got a big fish over the side of the boat, that's the live well. Mm -hmm. That's the live well for that fish right there. When you, these fish fight for their life. When they eat a bait and you bring them to the net, that's where you revive that fish at. You unhook that fish and you let that fish set in the net while you get your camera and your bump board ready to take your measurement. You do all that stuff. That fish is in there. It's heads under the water. It's safe. You, you really have nothing at all to worry about. Besides that fish jumping out of there. We've had that happen quite a few times. That's that's something you don't want to happen, and it does happen. But and, and what was the name of the brand of that net? This is an or, RS. And this is the one that it for the people at home, yes. this is the one you'd recommend? This yes, this is the net that I use. And solely the reason that I use this one, it's it's one of the smaller ones to use by yourself. I fish solo a lot. I do a lot of fishing. They get myself. bigger? <laughs> These oh, nets get yeah. bigger? This is, Good this, is Lord. this is a solo slimer. This is for fishing by yourself. This is a small one. Clearly, I can see like the net because I fish. Um, I talked before the show with him. I fish the Potomac a lot in a kayak and I fish a lot in the kind of a jig. And I could definitely see if I want to start musky fishing out of a kayak that having the right net would definitely be imperative to be able to control this fish actually once you get him hooked and next to the boat. The other thing would be rods, reels, baits. And I think we're going to be getting into that here in a minute. All right. But so, yeah, just yeah, go for it, dude. This is all you. So we have, we got a couple release tools that's very, very important. I like to try to stress this part. You want to have, you want to have a pair of good pliers. You, you definitely want to have a good pair of long nose pliers or a hook out. I recommend the Baker hook outs, to be completely honest with you. You got a good handle. You get down on the hook, pop it out keep your hands away from the fish's mouth they got big long teeth it's it's not fun getting a tooth to the hand believe me <laughs> secondly a regular pair of pliers we always like to keep a regular pair of pliers on hand just in case if you have to cut hooks if you got to cut hooks out we use a pair of bolt cutters handheld bolt cutters a lot of guys in the industry use a pair of nip x's here on the east coast we can't find them we have to we have to order them so Lowe's sells these we lose these pretty often. Lowe's sells them, and it's about the best way to go for me. Split ring pliers. Change your baits out. Change your hooks out. You got a bait hooked on the side of the net. Need to get it off real quick. There you go. Release gloves is very, very important. Very important. You'll see a lot of people in a lot of pictures don't use them. I'm very. I'm one that needs to start using release gloves a lot more. I took a hook to the hand. Mm. Yeah. The two hook points, one there and one there at the same time. Ah, and the yeah. same fish. Nope. Yeah, and I didn't didn't have my gloves out. It was something that I try to stress a little bit more. But something that a lot of guys a lot of guys don't use that I do use to help when you're handling a fish by yourself and to get a hook out. These mouth grabbers, these soft, soft plastic mouth grabbers. I don't like the metal ones. I do like the soft plastic though. These are really good. It's got a big open area. You can get it right on the, if you got a fish that's hooked back on the side or something, you can hook that on the beak and prop their, their uh, head over the side of the boat while they're in the net and take your baker hook out and pop the hook out. It's it's simple, two hands. You, you got nothing to worry about. That's so why I like- Why not the bogey long. grips? I'm not meant to cut you off. Like examples, like why the, why the soft grips, versus the bogey grips? The bogey grips have a metal, have the metal. And mm -hmm. in my experience and just, some of the guys that I learned from growing up do not, you know, they just did not like the Boga grips. Okay. It, they were against it. And I guess 
I mean, you see, you see biologists and stuff use them. So I don't know the whole ins and out on them. I just, that's what I've used. And it I works, used to have yeah. a big, I used to have a big yellow pair and I lost them. And I found these here at Walmart to be completely honest with you. And these worked out better because they were smaller. So I like these a little bit better to be completely honest with you. So they just worked out better for me. I've just, just what I've used. Uh, hook file here is, that's your best friend. I'm telling you, when you get to fishing a lot, three, four, five days, man, I'm telling you, you get, you realize your hooks, your hooks don't last. The hook point wears out. You have to keep that hook point sharp. Mm -hmm. Hook sets everything with these fish. And lastly, I got the first aid kit here. Try to keep all my stuff in here that I need. I got band-aids. I got antiseptic. I got tape. I have rubber gloves in case somebody else gets a wound that I got to work on them. How badly have you been Tweezers, bit? Have you bullets. ever been bit before? Like I've been bit, yes. Oof. It happens. If you chase these fish long enough, it happens. Yeah. It, there, it's, sometimes it's no avoiding it. You get a you get a deep hooked fish and there's just no way to avoid it. Mm -hmm. You get that's why I said with your gloves. If I have a if I have a deep hooked fish, I always go for my gloves. That's just you wouldn't think so, but this this material on these it just helps. Mm -hmm. Everything every little thing can help. And I mean your main vein right there, you don't want to yeah get down there working on a fish. You got to think about stuff like that. You got. Yeah, you know, and I appreciate your dedication you. because, guys, and this is important at home, is everything he's doing is to help preserve the fish. Most of this stuff, you know, if you wanted to be a little callous, you just basically cut the hook and just throw it back. But yeah. what he's doing right here is to protect this this resource we have for generations to come. And that's why we're showing this first, that you want all this to make sure you protect the fish. You know, I see a lot of times, example, like I do a lot of uh, saltwater fishing for sharks where people just cut the leader like 10 feet off the, the animal and just let it go back there. That's not necessarily the healthiest thing for them. So if you truly yeah. want to get into this sport of musky fishing in this area, you want to protect the resource. So please, you know, I also encourage you, you know, take these steps, get these little tools here it before we get to the fun much. stuff. It, it, it really doesn't. It doesn't. You get a baker hook out for like, I think six bucks, seven dollars for the hook out. A pair of cutters was like, maybe 11 bucks something like that a pair of pliers you get i mean you can get any kind of needle nose pliers you want like two dollars at walmart split ring pliers like three or four bucks i think 10 bucks for the grabber and like 10 bucks for a file you know what i mean a cheap first aid kit anybody any anybody that's fishing should have a first aid kit anytime you know mm -hmm. i've always that's always something that i've kept in my boat since i've owned a boat and that's just that's important to me i don't want I mean, anybody can slip off the boat and fall and cut themselves. You just, you never, you yeah. never know. So you always got to keep that in mind in the back of your brain. So, yep. But so what's next on, on, on what, on the to-do list? We have, we have some baits we can go over now. Put all this stuff back up here. So I guess as we get into the, into the bait section, like is there categories like for like small enough, like you have top water, uh, the middle water column, lower water column? Pretty much the same deal. Pretty much the exact same deal. It just everything in with musky fishing, they they kind of reference things a little bit different. As I'll explain here real quick. Like when you. When you're talking about smallmouth fishing, largemouth fishing, you got you got all your soft plastics, and there's various different soft plastics out there. So they don't really call them soft plastics in the musky world, and that's where it kind of threw me off when I first started musky fishing because I was talking to a bunch of friends and asking, 
man, where can I get them soft plastics you got? And he was like, what are we talking about? That's, you mean that rubber? <laughs> so it kind of threw me off a little bit, and that's why I had to, I had to really learn what everything was. And the next, the, another thing that really threw me off was a jerk bait. You think of a jerk bait bass fishing, a little mm -hmm. short billed jerk bait. So that's that, a jerk bait musky fish. Is that your jerk bait? That's a jerk bait for musky fish. Let yeah. me see. Let me grab a jerk bait just to give people a size comparison. Let me see if I can grab a jerk bait off the wall here. That's a jerk bait. That's a jerk bait? Yeah. You got it? Okay. I'll waddle back up here. A couple different types of bucktails. I just should hand him the box, it's fine. Especially since that thing is like, <laughs> you can tell the difference. So yeah, if you want to start, you want to start with like us one side and work your way down or whatever. And yeah, let me grab this. I feel like I'm going to own your son a gift card to a movie. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to take some time. we got some stuff here, guys. We're down the rabbit hole. Key too. Mm, yeah. Or it, it, you have that, you, lock, you can lock from the inside, you lock that door, and it locks out. Oh, it does? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, so start off here, for example. All right. You always need leaders. That's that's your first start. Leaders connect to the bait, fluorocarbon or wire, either or. I prefer to use wire just because there's not as many failures. Fluorocarbon, as everybody knows, can be cut. Wire is a lot harder to cut than fluorocarbon. That's just two differences. I use Trophy Time Leaders and Lures. He's out of West Virginia here. Just someone that I use. And just some products that I use. So you're gonna be tying your main line straight to, to that? Yes, okay. main line, tie the main line to it. And then I split, I don't use snaps. I split ring the bait straight to the- Straight, straight to, to the, the hook, leader. okay. Yep, split ring from the leader straight to the bait. That way, so it's less, chances of failure okay okay so we'll start with start with the rubber first bunch of different kinds of rubber out there different styles different ways to fish it there's really no wrong way to fish rubber rubber is just pretty much revolt it all results back to a jig pretty much okay if you think about it it results back to being a big type of jig so like a bottom bumping type of bait generally speaking or not no? necessarily okay. no and i had that i had that conception when i first started musky fishing bulldogs were really the big bait when i first started musky fishing everybody and you was could really, point that to the camera everybody was yeah, really perfect. everybody was really fishing bulldogs and that was the that is so cool the bait that I really got started musky fishing with was a bulldog mm -hmm. and i i got the perception of fishing it on the bottom like you would a jig or a tube or yeah. a lizard or anything like that well that was wrong you're dawing your hooks you're getting you're getting snag picking leaves up sticks all that stuff rubber in the musky world is pretty much made to be fished through the mid column of the water as compared to where in the bass world, you know, it's fished on the bottom. Mm -hmm. That's where the perception of it is. I didn't really actually get that conception until I fished a tube. And that's where it really threw me off because I got a tube and I thought, oh, I'm going to fish this thing on the bottom. Well, then I get it snagged up and I realize, hey, I'm getting fished. Come after it when I got it hanging up in the air. So I started talking to a couple other guys and they're like, yeah, man, how... Hmm. You didn't know that? So you're finishing on almost like a jerk bait. Yes, just hmm. like a jerk bait, pretty much. Just like okay. you fish a bass jerk bait, you're fishing the rubber. That's crazy. The same way. That's why I laid all these. Well, I shouldn't have put these two here. Yeah, yeah. Put them two up there and move these two down here because these were straight retrieve baits. And this is more of a jerking style bait. But that's why I put all these here because these are all pretty much the same. So like the categories. Yes, okay, cool. pretty much the same deal here. And then if you could pull the microphone off just a little bit over there, like up, you can pull it higher too if you want to get it out of your way. There right we here. go. Yeah, perfect. Right. 
Yes, that's why I put the whole middle because they're all more your jerk bait, your jerk bait style. What you would be more keen to think as a jerk bait would be like your bass like, style. Like, jerk guys, bait. hold that up because like look at this. Like <laughs> it's just stupid, insane Man, how big that is. It is. It doesn't take long. It's it's a lot in your mind it's yeah. overwhelming at first when you start fishing them but you get used to it and like anything else it comes it comes with doing it but you got some medusas here these are really these are really good introduction bait not hard to work there's really no wrong way to work any of these rubber baits when you you just pull and pause and okay try to keep them moving keep a constant action and then once you get back to the boat work a nice wide figure eight on them swim baits pretty much the same thing you know a lot of people a lot of people fish swim baits for bass and other creatures so it's you know it's pretty much as simple as it said it's just a swim bait a lot of cast and retrieve or pull paws it's really no wrong way to work them and that's that's the fun part about musky fishing because there's no rule book mm -hmm. you can you can watch you can watch a bunch of different guys fish baits and watch how they fish spots, but you can't go there and actually do it until you physically figure it out for yourself. And that's yeah. that's one of the fun parts about it. But then you got you got a fly, pretty much the that's same. That's a fly. Wow. Yep, a castable fly on on regular gear. Did you make that or buy yep. it? Yeah, wow. I make these. Yep, I make these myself, and I actually started making these because of the clear water on the Potomac River. It okay. You wouldn't think so, but them fish in that clear water they can see you from a mile away and they get used to seeing every other bait that they that is on a re available ready on the market and when it comes down to it they just they just don't see it so it worked out for us and and those are weighted or is it like yep. a top water bait or no they're weighted they fish okay. they fish the same fish same depth column as this six ounce tube here you know they go down about six to eight foot and just pull pause, same, same deal, just like a big streamer fly. And then our jerk baits here. Got a glide bait here. It's, this is a local maker here. He's actually from Clear Spring, Maryland. Allen Forest. Hmm. Really good, really good way to chase river muskies with a glide bait, jerk bait, glide bait, whatever. You see them called both, but that's crazy. Just a way. Another pool pause technique, just another different way to target them. There's really no wrong way to fish them once you mess with it a little bit and figure out how you like it. Ooh, a crankbait, okay. Yep. It's one of my favorite baits to fish, to be completely honest with you. A crankbait. We do we do very well on crankbaits. It's a trophy time. Steve Gold from out in West Virginia. Very nice. Very nice way to chase river muskies too. It's really, like I said, there's really no wrong way to fish these either. Just you can cast them out and retrieve, straight retrieve them, fish them like a jerk bait, like mm -hmm. you would bass style. However you want. And then here we go, get into some top water baits. It's a top water walk the dog. That's like a two pound smallmouth. That is yep. gnarly. <laughs> yeah, these things throw off a, a mean wake. You would not, you would not believe the side to side walk that these things have and the way they push water off. No, would that be considered like because I've seen the ones like for like tuna and things like that? Would that be a, like a, a normal size topwater, a larger for a muskie, or a smaller? This is like this is actually finesse, a smaller one. Okay. Yes, this is a smaller one. Um, this is a rabaska. This is actually from a guy in Wisconsin. He makes an eight inch and a twelve inch and uh, no, a ten inch and a thirteen inch. I think is what he makes. But yeah, this is actually a smaller one. And oh, uh, here's another actually a smaller style. That's More. like a whopper plopper. Yep. Just like this is actually called a, a Lake X. Uh, it's a Cannonball Junior Lake X. That yep. is so freaking cool. Yep. Just a plopper style bait. There's no wrong way to fish these. We catch a lot of fish on top water. A lot of fish on top water. A lot. Anywhere, anywhere you can think about on the river, and they'll they'll eat them down to about. 50 degrees believe it or not really yes I, i've heard guys say fish them until they bounce off of ice i've never fished them that cold but i've heard guys say that but that another one here that i really spinner like spinnerbait i really really do good on spinnerbaits 
all anywhere that there's grass edges I'll I try to pick up a spinner bait I throw a lot of spinner baits over the in lines you see there yeah like what's the comparing because I, I want to try and get I like getting in the rabbit hole and Jared's not here to stop me so what is the difference between using the inline versus the spinner bait for, for the muskies is, is it preference or is there actually a, a time that you want to throw one over the other a lot of a lot of it is preference you can throw either or in the same scenarios a lot of guys a lot of guys will tend to throw a spinner bait around grass i've seen or thicker cover they'll pick up a spinner bait but you can throw both around so primarily the, the same okay. primarily the same cover a bucktail you might not think so but these bucktails come through some pretty thick stuff really believe it or not yeah these oh, blades okay. the way the blades spin they they'll push a pretty good wake and they'll come through some pretty thick stuff but the larger the blades you get the bigger the wake you get so the better you can come through but you see there's gnarly different styles just hair you want to, you want to get down a little bit deeper you want to go with hair mm -hmm. you want to keep the bait riding a little bit higher usually going to go with the marabou is is my preference is what i've found to be a little bit more effective and work better for me marabou baits really high ride a lot higher in the water so then really for the viewers at home with these categories established kind of walk through like a, a ten thousand ten thousand mile view above like a, ge a general when would you throw each category what are you looking for so when you get out in the water you can kind of be in the ballpark of of the right approach all right perfect so usually the way I, i'll start out a trip say we're going to somewhere new or a, a new section of river that i haven't been to in a while i'll usually i'll usually start off with a search bait something that i consider a search bait any any time that the water is over 50 degrees 50 to 70 degrees a bucktail is, is usually pretty pretty predominant and guys will use that as their search bait and I'll, I'll do the same things but i like to use a crankbait as a search bait okay we'll pick up a crankbait and actually you can cover a lot of water quick with a crankbait so we'll use a crankbait usually and like a lot of other fishermen say let the fish tell you what they want i know a lot and then of you're not trying to hit bottom with that or are do you want bottom contact with sometimes the crankbait? It, sometimes it, okay. sometimes i work i work different retrieves these these baits get down I use I try to fish the square bill baits. A lot of guys have preference on what they like on depth range and the bill style and the bill the bill style and the bill uh, material. They make aluminum, uh, a polycarbonate bill, and a uh, I can't the circuit board. The circuit board okay making now yeah and a lot, they, you know they all three have their different styles. But I've I've been keen to stick with the polycarbonate bills. The square bills baits that run about six to eight feet is what i generally use in different applications i'll fish them shallower and i'll fish them deeper that way so try to get suspended fish just different applications you know just whatever i'm kind of feeling at that time and what i'm seeing on my graphs i always i'm always watching the graph seeing where bait is and that that's got a lot of a lot of statue and what i what i do too but I'll use, like I said, I'll usually start with a crankbait and search it out and go looking. Another good crankbait that we use, Shallow Invader. This is a really good, really, really, really good bait, actually. But we'll go and we'll go and throw them and try to get long cast and see if we can hook up with a fish or get a fish to follow in, find fish in new areas. Um, if that isn't working, I usually tend to go to rubber. Okay. Rubber is a really, really, really good fish producer. And it, like I said, there's no wrong way to fish it. As I said earlier, you can usually pick up rubber and, and find fish pretty easily. If you know, you're having a bad day, rubbers, rubbers, pretty easy to work. Now a bucktail or a top water or something like that. You can't, you can't generally do that. If the fish aren't biting, you can't take a, a spinner bait or a bucktail and throw at them a million times and make them eat it in my eyes that just mm -hmm. that's just not how it works and i don't do that so like i said I'll, I'll try to search that way but if i have a pattern that's developed established then i'll you know i'll go back to my days before on whatever baits i was using the day before or if we're in the prime uh summer months anywhere from may like i said may up to the hot water period 
after the hot water period up until even i mean i was we threw top water all the way up to thanksgiving i like to start the mornings okay. off with top water that's another another good way to start off so the season for top water would be like from May un until like December, honestly. Like it's that warmer water, generally speaking. Yeah, you, you wanna you wanna try to catch that warmer water period, okay. yes. But what I was getting ready to say also, top water bite at nighttime is is usually my number one bait. Really? Thrown at nighttime, yes. I fish a lot of top water at night. One, you don't have to worry about snags as much. Two, you can usually find the, the more active fish that are feeding in the top part of the water column. And three, you can hear the, you can, if you throw a prop bait, like I usually do at nighttime, you can hear where that bait is. So you're not search, you know, mm -hmm. on the river, you have current, you have boat that's moving. You're not always searching for where your bait's at, you know, fishing a rubber bait. Sometimes that can be hard pulling, pausing. Yeah. Your boat gets turned a little bit. So it just makes it a little tougher. That's just some things that I do, but. That's really good advice. Then once. Once I find fish in an area and I, or I know, or if I know where fish are and I'm coming up to an area, I know where fish are, we'll throw, I'll usually throw a jerk bait at them anywhere from, from a jerk bait, like a, a dive and rise style jerk bait to a side to side style jerk bait or a fly, something that gets down in their face and hangs there. Okay. Or if, or if the fish are deep, the fish are deep, we'll go to a jig. It's that is such a cool jig. Style, two different style jigs here. We can, you know, if I'm seeing fish on my graph that are suspended beside wood, like I was telling you how I caught that big fish the other day, I was actually jigging a bait like this. Huh. A bait this style here and on 25 foot deep water. That's crazy. Yeah, I was jigging it like four foot off the bottom. The bottom stroke was like four foot off and just popping it up. And I was just watching my graph, just, just scanning the area and just jigging. It's just just a way to do it you know you got to watch the watch the graph a lot when you're jigging and a lot of guys don't like that but that's where like the panoptics we talked about earlier it's such a game changer and optics yeah and you're down imaging uh that's that's all a game changer for all that but and then what about water clarity because like the river can fluctuate um you said with the flies like the water is like usually gin clear it is what is the ideal water and then if it is if you can fish in murky water or stained water, what do you change with your approach? Usually clear water, like I was saying, uh, you want to try to get them to eat, eat away from the boat. That's, that's my mindset when I'm fishing clear water. I want to try to do whatever I have to do to get the fish to eat away from the boat. And I like to use natural, natural presentations. A lot of times I'll use a lot of green, <laughs> a lot of green like this <laughs> or you know, a lot of people wouldn't think that's more natural style, but if you take a look at the suckers in our river, that's that's a pretty good mm -hmm. imitation coming through the water of a sucker pattern or another natural pattern or even something that, you know, a lot of people wouldn't think is a really natural pattern, but with a bright tail on it in the, in the clear water, that works really, really well. Or if the natural patterns aren't working, we'll try to go with something, something bizarre, something really, really bright and smaller in the clear water that's that's been a hmm. a ticket to catching them before too but at the same exact time i like to try to stay natural as much as i can until it doesn't work okay when stuff doesn't work that's when i start thinking outside the box and going other ways but one of the key things is getting comfortable with your baits and getting confidence in your baits if you don't have confidence in what's on the end of your line you're never going to catch fish mm -hmm. and i hate to say that but that's true until you get until you get confident saying okay you have 15 different baits here you can't throw all these in one day and and have a successful day that's not true you can you can go out there and take every single one of these baits and, and eliminate one at a time and then get confidence on one of them and go back to that one and say all right i had more confidence in this bait and then catch a fist mm -hmm. you know what i mean that's just that's just all part of having confidence I've learned I've learned switching baits a bunch of times throughout the day isn't the best way to have success musky fishing because I've seen seen where they'll eat this bait and then eat this bait at the same exact time. You know, what I mean, you'll have a guy throwing top water and a guy jigging in the boat and, you know, one person to catch a fish one way and then one person catch a fish another way all in the same day. And 
like I said, there's no rule book to them, so you you never know. You just have to figure it out and do whatever works. That's, so that's part of the part of the it, rhyme and reason. You just gotta figure them out. So if a kid wanted to go out tomorrow, and what are the three baits that you'd recommend for a novice to actually go do this? What time of year are we talking? I would. How about we go around the whole clock? Let's go I around the whole year. Three, three baits around the year, around the clock. A swim bait, a tube, and a crankbait. Reason I say that is because when it gets cold out, you can work both these baits really slow on the bottom or in the middle part of the water column, or you can work them erratically. A crankbait is a really good search bait and you can find fish anywhere. It gets warm out. You can burn this thing through the water just like you can a bucktail. You might not be able to get the exact same profile out of it, but you can work them faster when the water warms up. Tube, you can work faster when it gets it warms up. You can mm -hmm. work it side to side. You can work it up and down. And a swim bait, you can burn through. That's just three baits that I would recommend if, if you was to get started today and you wanted someone to catch a fish yeah so then now we can go down the rabbit hole now we got so those are the three baits guys that year round like that's your best bet so we're gonna go down the rabbit hole before we get into the other terminal tackle so let's go i guess you want to how how do you want to break down the seasons for baits i usually I, I try to go by rule of thumb i'll i have two different boxes i have a box that i try to keep I, i'll try to keep all my the baits that we're going to use this time of year, saying this time of year, meaning Thanksgiving up until March, you know, mid-March, I'll try to keep my rubber baits, my glide baits, my flies, my jigs, and some crankbaits all together. And then once the warmer months move up, you know, I mean, I'll I'll put another box together with bucktails and topwaters, okay. some lighter flies, some... uh some smaller rubbers like that's a that's another really big thing when it gets colder out you want to try to get a bigger presentation also if you think about it these fish are putting the feed bag on when it okay. gets colder out they're, they're trying to prepare for the spawn so they will eat a bigger bait now in the summertime they're they're chasing too so you you can go for a bigger bait too but when you get you, know, you get through some periods of the year they don't they do not want a bigger bait, so you can downsize. And a swim bait's a really good way to downsize. I really. So that's I really like your finesse see, approach, yeah. Yeah, like yeah. I, that's what I was looking for, more of a finesse, uh, finesse approach. Yeah, it's yeah. crazy because it's just like bass fishing too. Like in the summertime, the water gets a little bit hotter, and so you're going to be downsizing to a Ned rig, like a maybe Ned a smaller rig, jerk yep. bait. But then, you know, in the wintertime, you can go with that big jig or well, a bigger swim bait or a chatter. Yeah. That's like what I was going to say then. Next, a lot of guys are getting into it. A lot of guys are getting into throwing the, the bass style jigs. Uh, Picasso, I think that's what that one hmm. is. A Picasso darter head. I think that's what that oh, one that is. That's so cool looking. One of the musky pages they were making. But yeah, a lot of guys are getting into throwing bass style baits, and I would never imagined it. And Dude, that's really cool. Yeah. And, and then I guess this would, is a good segue to like the tackle for this. Is it, do you need to have specific tackle for? different presentations or can you get one rod and one real combo that can work for everything that you have that's that was the next way i was thinking about going that's that's a that's a tough way once you get into a certain size baits then you're definitely going to need a heavier rod but you can throw like everything i have here on the table you can throw everything here on the same rod yeah it will help if you have a higher a higher speed gear ratio reel for throwing bucktails and your top waters and stuff like that. But it's not necessarily, you can throw one rod and throw all these baits on the table. Yes, I do it all the time. Okay. I, have, I have one rod that I really like, St. Croix. My St. Croix, I really enjoy this rod. I got Charlie Rustler did uh, custom grips on me. I don't know if you know him or not, Rustler Rods. Did custom grips on these rods for me. And I really, I throw this, every one of them baits I throw on this rod here. And, what is that like an it. extra heavy or um, like what it's a eight foot medium heavy wow fast action yeah that's my river rod i really i really enjoy throwing that rod a lot medium heavy okay yep and then i have a 
I have a seven six uh, heavy here. That's my jerk bait rod. If I'm throwing jerk baits all day, I will. I'll throw this rod here. It's a, just a little bit stiffer, but it's a little bit shorter for working jerk baits. Like throwing, like I can, because I consider mm -hmm. I consider a tube a jerk bait. I can see I you know some rubber baits even I consider jerk baits. Just pull paws all day long. I'll throw something a little bit shorter. But it's all in it's all in what you get comfortable with. And like I said, you get comfortable with your equipment. You know its capabilities and you know what you're able to do with it. You might have one person tell you, you can't throw that bait on that rod. That rod ain't for that bait. Or you, you, you probably know from the bass world, you buy a rod that says, this is a jig rod. But you like throwing a swim bait or a crank bait on it or something like that. You know what I mean? It's, you just have to find what works for you and find a happy medium and a balance and, and try not to go over that. You know, you can't take a claw hammer, can't take a claw hammer in and go in and paint a wall with it. Mm -hmm. it it's different, but. It's, so what kind of bait caster and line, what, what, what do you generally recommend for people? What is your main line like and what kind of bait caster uh, do you think people, can we use our bass reels or should we get a specific reel for it? The problem with using a, a smaller profile bass reel is you will tear the gears out of it. Okay. Very, very quick. That's the, that's the big thing with using the, the heavier duty reels. You see a lot of, a lot of guys are going to the new Shimano Tranks. I, I got a couple of the Tranks. I really like them. I I recommend anybody getting into the sport. Abu Garcia makes a Max Toro reel. That's that's the reel that I have in this rod right here. That is one of the best reels that I have found for cold water fishing. And what's the gear ratio on that? Oh, Just for the people at home. This one? I can't remember. You don't answer. What, uh, what, what's, what's the name of the reel? Because I, I got a it's computer. Really, it's 531. 531? Yeah. So you, so you want that lower gear ratio to winch them? That lower, yes. I like the lower gear ratio in the winter time, and that's just ice doesn't build up. You get the higher speed reels, it seems like the line doesn't come off. The water doesn't shed off the line through the guides as as much, and you build up ice a little bit faster. Just through my preference of what I've learned, I always try to recommend. There's a braid out there, Andy's braid. I don't know if you've ever heard of it or not. Mm -mm. Um, can't. It's the, graphite. Graphite. Okay. It's graphite. Yeah. I didn't want to say. I didn't want to say the wrong material, but it's gra. It's a graphite blend. It's really good. Really, really good line. That's what I use. We use a hundred pound Andy's braid. Um. Like I said, I use Shimano Tranks reel, uh, Boo Garcia. And your your bass equipment, you can you can use your bass equipment for smaller baits. Like I said, once you get into the, you get into, you get into throwing like a six ounce bait yeah. one day on your bass rod, you know what I mean? And it's whippy and flimsy and you're going to be like, oh, well, this wasn't no fun. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? It's the same exact thing as, like I was saying, you can't really take a hammer in and go in and paint a wall. Yeah. And then what size braid again did you say? Like uh, I use a hundred pounds. hundred pounds. Good God, man. Okay. You got to think about it. You, you got to think about the shock on it and when you're casting a big bait all the time. You can you get away with lighter for the guys that want to like like just like dabble in it or you, you think 100 you, you definitely can, you need can it. get away with 65 yes okay 65 i used to use 65 for the longest time i did not have a problem i I broke a bait off about a year and a half ago i broke a bait off and it was probably my fault the line was on that that reel for a couple years and i didn't check it but after that i changed all my rods out i changed i said i'm changing everything to 100 pounds and that's just what i went to mm -hmm. It just wasn't, it was a no brainer for me. So, so then, so definitely get the right rods guys, you know, get a reel that's meant for handling some, some creatures like this, a lower gear ratio, hundred pound braid, get yourself some baits. And then, but talk about something like the figure eight, why the figure eight for people at home? Like what is important with that at the end of well, every retrieve? Well, these fish, these fish follow a lot. So you, you tend to usually run out of room you'll notice a lot in the clear water. You, you run out of room when fish chasing the bait down. You cast your bait out. You can only cast so far. Working your bait in, it comes over the fish's head. As the fish is following the bait in, nine times out of 10, if he don't see you and he's following your bait in, well, you pull that bait out of the water and he don't eat it. He just swims off. Mm -hmm. You bring the bait in and you go into a figure eight. They're a predator. Their instinct is to hunt that bait down and eat it. So when you come into the figure eight, it gives them that ample opportunity to eat the bait. And plus you're taking it and making turns 
and direction changes and that just strikes them to eat. Mm-hmm. Once you make that direction, you make that direction change. Usually when you get a really hot fish, that's all it takes for them to eat. They'll come following yeah. in and their fins will be quivering while they're following. And you can see them. Fish is usually pretty hot and it's eat. It's ready to eat coming in on the, the follow. And you see them as soon as you go into that figure eight, like I said, that direction change usually strikes and just triggers their instinct every single time. Because And guys, for you guys that haven't actually specifically targeted them before, one big thing with the muskie is that it, it is not afraid of the boat. It will follow. And so you'll get what they'll say, like, I had like three or four follows today, but I didn't get bit. Nope. This is for my little research oh, on yeah, it. it so, you know, you're having follows, a massive log follow you. Follows the boat. is a good thing and a bad thing. Follows is a good thing and a bad thing. If you go to a new area and you're not seeing anything, and then you're getting follows, well, you know you're around fish. But mm-hmm. at the same exact time, if you're at a place where you know there's fish at and you're getting 8, 10, 12 follows a day at that spot, then you're usually not going to catch that fish. You move on to the next spot, you know, wait for a major or a minor or a good moon phase and come back on it and catch that fish at that point in time. That's something else. Well, I had yep. you. Is that real? Is the moon phase important? Oh, it's 100% real. It's 100% real. And I'm telling you, these fish, it's like a light switch. Sometimes, sometimes you can, you can go out on the river and fish all day long, fish over top of fish, see them, not catch anything. As soon as you know that moon phase is coming on, you get back to that spot and be stealthy. Five minutes before that moon phase, cast the bait in there, bang, as soon as that time comes, <laughs> turn on like a light switch. It's just, it's the way it is. It's, it's happened to me several times. I didn't believe it until I had a friend tell me. About, we was out night fishing one time and he's like i don't know why you're making all them casts he's like you're just you're spooking all the fish off i was like what do you mean man he said we're five minutes away from the major just wait a minute you know he called a fish i was like no way that don't work he pulled his phone out and showed okay you gotta talk uh, t- talk a little bit about that about the, about the moon site what are you looking for is it like a high tide low tide type of deal or what, what's i'm i'm not the 100 best person with with it it's the majors and the minors. I have an app on my phone and that's how I've always, that's how I've always tracked them. And it's, it's just when the moon, it's the best, the peak feeding times. You have two majors a day and two minors a day. When the moon's at a certain, a certain phase, you have one or you have none. It just all revolves around moon phase and everything. And I, I really wish that I knew a lot more about it. And it's something that I'm, I'm lear- I learn more about it mm-hmm. every time I go out on the water. That's the first thing that I check every time before I unload my boat or before I get out of my vehicle. I open my phone, go to my app, and look what time the moon phases are and see what it is. I usually check that before I check the river levels. Okay. At- that will dictate my trip usually. If I can fish around a peak time, I'm going to do it. And then is that with a full moon and new moon? Does that yes. affect it at all? Either? Okay. Yes. New moon, full moon, everything is a is a big play into it. And you you'll hear a guy say, "I caught I caught a fish this year on the new moon on this date," and they come back the very next year on that exact date on that full moon, and they'll catch that same exact fish. Like them fish pattern themselves on that moon, and that's just the way that they live. They live. It's it's interesting. The moon is crazy when it comes to these fish, and you learn something new every day. Researching it and learning about it is there's there's so much to it, and it's a lot out there. It's a lot, man. It's 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 not just picking up a rod and going and casting for mm-hmm. the fish. There's so much to it. It, it is, and I well, I know we're gonna have you back on on this show uh, again. And is there anything else that you really think that the listeners need to know about at home to get started on this thing? Think about the fish's well-being and have fun. Do not let it beat you up. You cannot. I'm telling you, you you have to put the work in. There's there's only one place that success comes before work, and that's in the dictionary, man. Mm-hmm. You, you have to you have to put the time in, and you have to do it. If you do not work for these fish, you're not going to be rewarded. You might go out. You might be that lucky angler, and you might go out and catch one your first trip. You might go out and catch one of your first three trips, but you're not. As soon as you think you got these fish figured out, they're gonna they're gonna pull a move on you, and you're back to the drawing board. And that's what makes it fun for me. Yeah, that's what you can't let them beat you up. You can't. You always got to think. 
if I had fun, I had a good day. That's all you got to keep in mind. Must there are fish 10,000 cast. You're not going to catch one every trip. And it's not going to happen. You have to enjoy it. You got to make it fun. And that's that's the bottom line to it. If you don't make it fun, you're not going to enjoy it. And that's that's all it is to it. Amen. Amen to that. Norman, where, where can people follow you? Oh, my Facebook. I just I have Facebook. I post a little bit on there here and there. And I just just do my thing out fishing. You see me out fishing. Come say hi. Got any questions? Shoot me a message. Anything you need. I'll be more than willing to help anybody out. You need some baits. You need some need some rods. Anything. Message me. Need leaders. Anything. Message me. I have a bunch of gear. I always try to help people out. You want to go fishing? Message me. I like taking new people out, get new people on these fish. That's that's about everything for right now. Norman, thank you so much, dude. I really appreciate you coming in, guys. Um, links to everything we talked about will be in the episode description. Along, we'll, we'll tag like some rods, reels, line, just just a little bit of everything to uh, kind of get people started. And again, reach out to this guy. He's awesome. I think he's going to be an up and coming superstar in the musky world in this area. Uh, again. Like and subscribe to the YouTube channel, guys. It really helps us. The bigger we can grow, the more fun things we can do in the future. So please hit the like button, subscribe to the channel, and we'll see you next time. My name is Thomas Aarons. This was Fishing the DMV. See you guys. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Aarons and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.